history of coronations from ancient to modern times. The coronation of King Charles III and Queen Consort Camilla will be unique in modern times. The United Kingdom is the only monarchy in Europe which still holds coronations. But in the past, the ceremonies were widespread across the world. They were used as a way to link the mystic chain of dynasty, secure the reigns of new monarchs, and ensure that their subjects viewed them with the proper reverence. Placing a crown upon a monarch's head was a powerful symbol. It was believed to bestow a heavenly mandate to rule, or even transform the monarch into a living god. Most people don't think of King Charles as especially divine, but he also won't be expected to smite an enemy or walk a marathon around the city as Egyptian pharaohs did, be asked to publicly defend his claim to the throne like the Persian kings, or lead his army on a month's long march to the Vatican like the Holy Roman emperors. And Camilla is unlikely to perform a blood sacrifice to summon a vision serpent, like a Mayan queen consort. Today, let's explore the evolution of coronations across the world, from ancient to modern times. See how different cultural traditions built on each other to create modern ceremonies, and learn how secularism and revolutions have done away with all other coronations in Europe. This episode is the first in a four-part series on coronations I will be releasing over the next few months. Episode 2 will explore coronation traditions still going on today in the monarchies of Africa, Asia, and Oceania, and what the other 11 monarchies of Europe are doing instead. 3 will look specifically at the history of the English and British coronation, and 4 will be a step-by-step -step guide of what to expect at the coronation of Charles and Camilla. Don't want to wait? Patrons can see all 4 episodes today. A link is in the description. A coronation at its core is the act of placing a crown upon a monarch's head. Crowns of various designs can be found all over the world as symbols of high office and even divinity. Deities in numerous religions are distinguished by wearing crowns. So it's little wonder that this headgear was used to elevate a sovereign above the masses. The oldest known crown dates to about 4000 BCE. The Copper Age crown was discovered in a cave near the Dead Sea. Another quintessential part of kingship across cultures is the throne. The oldest surviving throne was built into the wall of Knossos in Crete around 1800 BCE. Aside from crowning and enthroning, other rituals involved in coronation ceremonies depend on the faith and culture of the monarchy in question. Ancient Egypt the first record we have of an Egyptian coronation was that of Scorpion II, circa 3100 BCE. He was the ruler of the Upper Kingdom, as in further up the Nile, and wore a white crown. The rulers of Lower Egypt wore a red crown. Scorpion II conquered the Lower Kingdom and united Egypt. From then on, pharaohs wore a combination of the two crowns. They were seen as divine. When one died, their successor was named immediately, so that the kingdom's cosmic protection would not be broken. It was crucial that the new monarch attend the burial of the old. The coronation would wait until the first day of a new season, symbolizing a new era. A high priest invested the new pharaoh with the royal ka, or spirit. This ritual made the pharaoh a son of Ra, the sun god, Horus, the falcon god, and Osiris, the god of life, death, and fertility. The pharaoh was given five names, a Horus name, a goddess name, a golden name, and a throne name were added to his birth name. The throne name is what we generally know them by today. The monarch then appeared before the people, first in the white crown, then in the red, then wearing both. Other regalia included a false beard, a shepherd's crook associated with magic, and a fly whip symbolizing authority. Monarchs wore a kilt with a bull's tail, symbolizing strength, hanging from the back of the belt. 
coronation ceremonies and feasts went on for up to a year. Various rites had to be performed before the monarch was seen to be fully embedded with the divine ka. The Seed Festival included complex rituals meant to restore the pharaoh's vital life force, the specifics of which are not understood today. In the 30th year of their reign, once their vitality began to lag, the ceremony was repeated, and again every three years after that. Ramses II had 14 seed festivals in 64 years on the throne. In the Sokar festival, the monarch pulled a sacred boat to the Nile to honor the god of the underworld. It marked the death of the previous monarch and the foundation of the new monarch's tomb. Smiting of the enemy. During this ritual, the monarch murdered the leader of a defeated realm by striking him with a ceremonial mace or sword. Circumambulation of the White Walls The pharaoh walked around the limestone walls of Memphis to symbolize their right to rule over the capital city. This would have been a jaunt of about 24 miles, or just under the length of a marathon. When a pharaoh died, they were believed to become fully divine and assimilate with Osiris and Ra. Their ka would be there to impart divinity upon their heir. Hebrew Bible Kings in biblical Israel were crowned and anointed, most often by a prophet or high priest. Anointing is the ritual act of pouring aromatic oils over a person's body and was used to consecrate priests. The oil or chism was believed to impart the spirit of the Lord. According to the book of Samuel, the prophet anointed Saul as Israel's first king. When Saul died, his crown was presented to his son-in-law, David. 2 Kings 11.12 and 2 Chronicles 23.11 detail the coronation of seven-year-old King Joash. The ceremony took place in the doorway of the temple in Jerusalem. The crown was placed upon his head and the testimony given to him, followed by anointing by a high priest. The people applauded and shouted, God save the king, as trumpets blew and hymns were sung. Later, Christian kings would borrow heavily from these passages. The Book of Esther mentions Esther being crowned as the queen consort of Ahasuerus, king of Persia. Ancient Persia Rulers of the Achaemenid Empire were known as the King of Kings, as they ruled over numerous sub-kingdoms. They had a gold throne and crown, which was in the style of a diadem or a brow band. Subordinate kings were permitted only silver. Persian coronations were influenced by the Egyptians. The ceremony transformed the king into a new, sacred person with magical powers. He assumed a new throne name and then kindled a royal fire, which was extinguished only at his death. The king crowned himself in the presence of princes and nobles. The best eyewitness account we have is from Greek historian Plutarch. He described the coronation of Artaxerxes I in 465 BCE. The king entered the temple of a warlike goddess, probably Anahita. He removed his robes and put on the 150-year-old robes of King Cyrus the Elder. Then Artaxerxes ate a cake of figs, chewed turpentine wood, and drank a cup of sour milk. Aside from the wood, this was an everyday Persian meal. The sour milk was likely a yogurt drink called dew. Nearly a thousand years later, in 579 CE, the coronation of Hormizd IV, king of the Sasanian Empire, was described by a Venetian diplomat. The new king came towards the throne, so magnificently attired that the glitter of his bejeweled costume awed. Leading magnates rose, mentioned the events of the previous reign, and asked the new ruler to justify his claim to the throne. The sovereign gave his qualifications, noble descent, wisdom, justice, etc., and pledged to act responsibly and piously to defend the Zoroastrian faith and Iranian people, and to dispense justice. 
In return, he demanded the oath of allegiance from the assembly. Noblemen led the king to the throne, and priests blessed the crown and placed it upon his head, while invoking the names of earlier kings. The assembly then cried, Long live the king of kings! The coronation was celebrated with a three-day feast. Mayan Empire in the Americas, Aztec, Mayan, and Inca civilizations all distinguished their new rulers with special headdresses, and their kings were believed to have a divine mandate. During a Mayan coronation ceremony, the new king sat on a pillow covered with a jaguar pelt. A high priest placed an elaborate headdress, decorated with feathers, seashells, and obsidian on his head. The coronation was followed by feasts, celebrations, and human sacrifices. The Mayans usually sacrificed high-status prisoners of war to the gods to curry favor. If a new king could capture a rival king and have him decapitated at his coronation, it was especially auspicious for his future rule. Stone stels were carved and erected to commemorate a king's ascension. One such stel from the 400s depicts the crowning of Siaj Chan Kawail II. His dead father can be seen hovering above him as a supernatural being. In another from the 600s, Queen Consort Zok cuts herself with a stingray spine and sacrifices some of her own blood to summon a vision serpent to commemorate the ascension of her husband and nephew, King Itzamnaj Balam II. Roman Empire the status of the early Roman emperors was in contrast to the previous Roman kings. While a king received his mandate from the gods and heredity, emperors were elected democratically and proclaimed by the Senate and the army. In 27 BCE, the first emperor, Augustus, shunned the pomp and ritual of monarchy. Rather than a golden crown, he wore a laurel, an ancient Greek headdress made of leaves, which symbolized wisdom and achievement. But it wasn't long before the title of emperor began to pass down family lines, and emperors encouraged their people to worship them as living gods. By 284, Diocletian greatly increased the ceremony surrounding the emperor. He wore a golden crown and forbade anyone but himself to wear royal purple. Byzantine Empire In 476, the western half of the Roman Empire fell, but Constantine the Great continued the line of emperors in the eastern capital of Constantinople and made his empire Christian. He adopted the golden diadem worn by Persian kings. When his nephew Julian was proclaimed emperor, he was hoisted upon a shield and crowned with a gold necklace removed from one of his standard bearers. Subsequent emperors were crowned in a similarly improvised manner until Emperor Leo II decided to be crowned in a religious ceremony by the Patriarch of Constantinople. From then on, the coronation developed in ritual and significance, influenced by Persian tradition. When the new emperor entered the Hagia Sophia Church, senators and patricians bowed before him. The emperor received communion. Lengthy prayers were read as he was dressed in purple robes. The patriarch held the crown over his head, and the assemblage cried out, Holy, holy, holy! The moment the crown touched his head, the emperor became holy. In the 11th century, anointing the sign of the cross on the emperor's head with holy oil was added in. Medieval Europe As Christianity spread, Byzantine coronations influenced the kingdoms of Western Europe. King Sisanod of the Visigoths was crowned in 631 in Spain. His successor, King Wamba, was anointed by the Archbishop of Toledo. The oldest surviving Christian crown, the Iron Crown of Lombardy, was used by early Italian kings. It was said to be made from a flattened nail from the true cross of Christ and to have belonged to Constantine the Great, though it has actually been dated to the 8th century. 
This crown was used in Charlemagne's coronation after he conquered the Lombards in 774. Over four decades of warfare, the king of the Franks amassed an empire which stretched across Central Europe. In the year 800, Charlemagne traveled to Rome to protect Pope Leo III from his enemies. On Christmas Day, while he was attending Mass, the Pope surprised him by placing a crown upon his head and proclaiming him Holy Roman Emperor. This most famous of historic coronations recognized Charlemagne as the heir to the ancient Roman emperors. But in reality, Charlemagne likely pressured Leo to do it. After Charlemagne's death, his empire fell apart, but his successors, based in modern-day Germany, continued to journey to Rome to be crowned by the Pope. First, they had to be elected in Frankfurt by the seven prince electors. Then, they were crowned King of the Romans by the local archbishop. Then, they would set out on an expedition to Rome, which might take weeks or months. Emperors were often at war with their neighbors, so they took their army with them. If they managed to conquer new kingdoms along the way, all the better. Some elected kings of the Romans never made it to the Vatican to be crowned Holy Roman Emperor. If they did arrive, the coronation would be held in St. Peter's Basilica. While prayers were chanted, the imperial crown was placed upon the emperor's head, and he was given a sword. A papal coronation was necessary to be Holy Roman Emperor until 1508. King Maximilian I found his way to Rome blocked by his enemy, the Venetians. He didn't want to risk his life for the crown, so he changed the law so German monarchs could declare themselves Holy Roman Emperor. Charlemagne's successors in what became France held their coronations at Rome's cathedral. Upon their heads was placed the crown of Charlemagne, which didn't actually belong to the great emperor, but was made for his grandson, Charles the Bald. The Capetian kings of France chose to have their heirs crowned during their lifetime in order to avoid succession disputes. The heir was regarded as a junior king, but held little power. As primogeniture became stronger, the practice died out. The last junior king of France was the future Philip II. When his father, Louis VII, died in 1180, Philip was crowned again, this time as a full king. He had four large bejeweled fleur-de-lis added to the crown of Charlemagne, and a copy made to crown his new bride, Isabella. One of the two crowns, it's not clear which, was melted down by the Catholic League during the Siege of Paris in 1590. The surviving crown of Charlemagne was used to crown kings, and the crown of Jean of Evreux from the 1300s crowned queens until the 1775 coronation of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. The essential elements of medieval European coronations were anointing with holy oil, crowning, and enthroning, done in the context of a religious service. For Catholics, it was part of a holy mass. Later on, for Protestants, it was part of a holy communion. But the specifics varied depending on local beliefs and customs. Many coronations included the monarch being presented with pieces of regalia, Scepters, an ancient symbol of power, were common. Orbs representing the Christian world with the monarch as its overlord also became popular. Sovereign rings representing the monarch's mystical marriage to their nation were used in England, Russia, and other kingdoms. All of these rites, steeped in religion, were believed to confer that the anointed monarch was ordained by heaven. To question their command was to question God. But in the 1500s, the Protestant Reformation began to challenge that idea. Enlightenment Europe as ancient ideas about religion and social hierarchy were questioned in philosophical salons and in bloody revolutions, monarchs clung to tradition. Holy Roman emperors no longer needed to be crowned by the Pope to claim the title, but they ruled over a number of territories which often did require coronations. 
Holy Roman Empress Maria Theresa spent months learning the equestrian skills necessary for her Hungarian coronation. As Hungary did not recognize queens, she was proclaimed king when the crown of St. Stephen was placed upon her head at St. Martin's Cathedral. In 1743, the Empress journeyed to Prague to be crowned Queen of Bohemia in St. Vitus Cathedral with the crown of St. Wenceslas. In 1804, in the wake of the French Revolution, General Napoleon Bonaparte declared himself Emperor of France. He devised a magnificent coronation, drawing on the traditions of Charlemagne rather than those of previous French kings, who had so recently lost their heads. Rather than Rome's cathedral, Napoleon's sumptuous ceremony was conducted in Notre Dame de Paris, and an archbishop wouldn't do. Pope Pius VII traveled from Rome to conduct the rites. The emperor and empress Josephine arrived by carriage. He wore a white and velvet vest with diamond buttons, a crimson velvet coat, and a laurel wreath made of gold, reminiscent of the emperors of Rome. She wore a white satin gold embroidered gown. Upon entering the cathedral, each was dressed in a robe of crimson velvet lined with ermine, which weighed 80 pounds each. Napoleon's was carried by four dignitaries, while Josephine's was supported by Napoleon's three sisters. Two orchestras and four choirs serenaded the couple down the aisle. The Pope anointed them with holy oil, during which the emperor was noted to have yawned several times. Napoleon placed the crown on his own head and then placed a smaller crown on Josephine's head as she knelt before him. The medieval crown of Charlemagne had been destroyed in the revolution, so Napoleon had a new one forged to look as close to the original as anyone could remember. Napoleon's enemies complained that crowning himself was an act of arrogance. There were even rumors that he snatched the hat off the Pope's head but it reflected the growing secularism of the time, and everyone knew that Napoleon had gotten the crown with his own cunning, rather than by divine or genetic right. Once the emperor and empress were proclaimed, the assemblage did not cry out, God save the emperor, but rather, may the emperor live forever. Six months later, Napoleon conquered Italy and was crowned in Milan with the Iron Crown of Lombardy. Napoleon's conquests significantly altered the map of Europe. He broke up the Holy Roman Empire and replaced many of Europe's old dynasties with his own relatives. After Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo, some ancient royal families regained reduced thrones, but the absolutism of their rule was on shaky ground. In 1806, former Holy Roman Emperor Francis II was reduced to being merely Emperor of Austria. The last few kings of France mostly chose to lie low rather than have elaborate coronations. Charles X dared to throw himself a coronation in 1825, but the high cost of the event was unpopular with the people, and he was overthrown in another revolution five years later. The French Republic was restored for good in 1870, and the new government sold off the crown jewels in the hopes of avoiding further royalist agitation. Russian Tsars considered their empire to be the Third Rome. Their coronations were heavily influenced by the Byzantines. In 1896, Nikolai II and Alexandra Fyodorovna were crowned in Uspensky Cathedral. A festival was held in Moscow where free food and beer was given away. Rumors that there would not be enough caused a stampede and over a thousand people were crushed to death. The new emperor and empress wanted to stay in that night to pray for the dead, but their advisors insisted that they attend a ball thrown by the French ambassador. The people saw their new monarch as callous in the face of the tragedy. This was one of many missteps on the road to the downfall of the Romanov dynasty in 1917. 
The last emperor of Austria-Hungary to wear St. Stephen's crown was Karl I in 1916. He was the nephew of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, who would have been emperor had he not been assassinated, sparking World War I. After Germany and Austria lost the war in 1918, Karl's empire was disbanded, and he was banished from the country. Germany had a revolution that year as well. Kaiser Wilhelm and Germany's many lesser monarchs all lost their thrones. Only 12 European monarchies managed to survive to the 21st century, and only one, Britain, is bold enough to still hold coronations. In next week's episode, we'll find out what the other 11 European monarchies are doing instead of coronations, and explore coronation traditions which are still going on in Africa, Asia, and Oceania today. Want even more tea on history? Check out the History Tea Time podcast, available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. A special thank you goes to my patron, Countess Von Zarovich. Don't want to wait to see the next episode? Patrons get exclusive early access to almost all of my multi-part series on Patreon early. If you would like to become a patron and help me make more fascinating history videos, check out the link in the description. Thank you for watching.